owner for a couple of years and remarkable lawyer. And I said, I, I believe she is the coolest lawyer in the country. You guys will make that decision very soon. Uh, Alyssa, do you want to kind of, uh, let me kind of, you, you want to give a quick introduction? I'll just go through the slides and uh, you just tell me when you want to move them, okay? Sure. Lou, thanks very much for having me. And um, I have to say that there was quite a chuckle in my office because several of our uh, attorneys here at Littler Mendelssohn received Lou's invite, describing me as the coolest labor attorney in the country. And it's been um, uh, fun here at this end receiving the my colleagues' comments about my being the coolest labor attorney in the country. Um, you know, every once in a while, the government comes out with statistics on the most stressful jobs in America. You know, when you get the typical firefighter and police uh, folks on the list, and in my personal opinion, I think that recruiters for government contractors uh, should make it to the top ten most stressful jobs in America. Um, in part because the Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs is really making it very challenging for recruiters to proactively go out and seek qualified candidates for jobs. The record keeping that OFCCP has imposed on government contractors is onerous and burdensome. And the lion's share of this is going to fall on government contractor recruiters. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor's regulatory agenda for 2010, for 2011, and 2012 is aggressive. The, um, in my personal opinion, I, I think with a divided Congress, um, a democratically controlled Senate, and a Republican controlled House, I think that the only way for President Obama to achieve his agenda is going to be through the executive agencies like the Department of Labor and like OFCCP. The OFCCP, in publishing its fiscal year 2012 budget justification, has certainly given us a preview of what's to come. Um, for example, I mean, OFCCP in the budget document talks about what it thinks it accomplished in fiscal year 2010. It indicates that it made significant contributions to its enforcement goals. It completed 4,960 routine compliance audits, attaining 99% of its goal of doing 5,000 of them. Of the 5,000, it found violations in 1,071 facilities. That is a huge increase over the number of violations that OFCCP has found under prior administrations. Of the 1,071 violations, um, 919 of them were resolved through conciliation agreements compared to 694 in the previous year. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do the math and realize that you know, if OFCCP is finding violations in you know, 225 more workplaces, it has certainly ramped up the amount of time and energy it is spending when it does go on site to government contractor workplaces. And the reason why it's never going to add up to 100% is because some of the compliance reviews, the random audits that OFCCP began are still not finished. Uh, they're making their way through these. Some are going to end up in enforcement, and others will close out, but in a different fiscal year. From the audits that OFCCP closed in fiscal year 2010, it obtained 9750272 dollars in remedies for 12,397 alleged victims. Hey, so let me just stop you for a second. Is this the right slide I should be showing? A number of people, yeah. I just want to make sure I'm on point with you. Right, right, right. I'm reading the statistics from oh. their fiscal year 20. I'm on the second bullet. Um, I'm talking about some of the statistics that they now reported that they achieved in fiscal year 2010. And I'm going to sort of transition a little bit into, in a, in a couple of minutes, what it is that they are previewing for us. Where is it that they intend to go? And then I'm going to sort of move into how the recruiters play into this entire administration's agenda, because they are front and center on this. 
Um, okay. So um, uh, going back to the statistics, I mean, this is an agency that um, is definitely going to play a very active enforcement role, uh, especially for what they view to be fiscal year 2011 now and fiscal year 2012. And uh, yes, I know that there's this uh, potential for the government to shut down. Um, and yet, even if it shuts down temporarily, I think at the end of fiscal year 2011, I think OFCCP is likely to have hit its own metrics in terms of the number of audits it wants to conduct, the remedies it's going to look for, and the number of violations it wants to cite companies for. In 2012, um, OFCCP has a pretty aggressive um, agenda. In 2011, let me back up a little bit. In 2011, there are several proposed regulations that are likely to be on the table. And the two that I think are going to affect recruiters most are going to be the OFCCP's intention of publishing a regulation dealing with veterans. And the reason why it's going to affect recruiters is because to the extent that you are using online application systems that are soliciting race and gender right now, if the veterans regulation is published and it goes final, you will likely be required to solicit information on veteran status of candidates that are internet applicants. And OFCCP is toying with the idea of requiring applicants pre-offer of employment to be asked questions about whether they'd like to volunteer that they have a disability. And that is going to be fraught with peril. But that's going to potentially enter your world in 2011. And in 2012, a preview of what's to come is that OFCCP is looking to develop an online web portal where companies will be required to upload annually, not just when you're audited, a lot of information, including information on your applicant populations. And right now, as we're talking on the telephone, you know, there is no web portal. This data that you maintain and that you work on typically doesn't get cleaned up unless and until there's an audit. And OFCCP, as I mentioned in my um, earlier remarks, really only gets to about 5,000 out of about 110,000 workplaces per year. But if they go to this new potential web collection tool, um, the obligation for you to be maintaining your applicant flow data in pristine form is going to be ramped up like you've never seen it before. So having potentially scared the bejesus out of you for 2011 and 2012, I would like now to turn to the next slide, which talks about the three major concepts that OFCCP is expecting you as recruiters to understand and be a part of in your organization. And the three concepts are utilization, adverse impact, and outreach. Utilization is going to answer the question when a government contractor puts together its annual affirmative action plans for each of its establishments with 50 or more employees, one of the questions that it is required to analyze is, how does my employment of women and minorities compare to my good faith estimates of availability? As a supply and service contractor, meaning someone who's not in the construction contractor business, um, if you are a supply and service company, the government doesn't tell you what your goals are. You have to go through the annual process of putting together groupings of individuals and mapping your groups to the census code and asking the questions for each of these groupings. You know, what, what is my percentage of women and minorities? But at the end of this annual evaluation of how does your employment of women and minorities compare to your own good faith estimates of what is available, if the organization determines that its employment of women and minorities is below availability, and there are several different tests that you can use to decide that, and that's getting a little bit into the weeds, but let's just say that the organization determines that its employment of women and minorities is below availability and sets a goal in a job group. The, the fact that the organization is self-admitting it doesn't have a sufficient percentage of women and minorities in the workplace triggers a legal obligation on you, the recruiters, to make sure that you know 
what are the job titles that roll into this group, and when you recruit going forward for any job that rolls into this group, you are maintaining documentation of exactly where you have looked and what it is that you are doing to try to improve the representation of diverse qualified candidates who are expressing an interest in that opportunity. The, unless the employer is going to remedy its setting of a goal only by moving candidates internally in the organization, thus placing a premium on succession planning and mentoring and development. If, unless they're going to remedy this by looking internally, any time there is a job group with a goal and the employer is going to recruit from the outside, the documentation burden falls squarely on you. The government is not as concerned with whether or not you've hired someone who happens to be a female or a minority. You can never, ever, ever, ever hire someone because of race or because of gender. But the only way to improve the representation of women and minorities when you are using external recruiting as a means by which to broaden the representation of women and minorities, the documentation burden falls on you. So it is critical in a government contractor workplace for recruiters to be included in the discussion of where are their goals? What are these titles? Um, you know, are we going to be you know, having opportunities to make progress towards this goal in the coming year? That has to be a critical component of the discussion. Um, the next concept is adverse impact. An adverse impact is the question that is going to uh, be answered when you look across departments, across managers, across time. Do policies and practices at this employer's workplace cause women or men, minorities or non-minorities, to be selected at much lower rates than their comparators? That's the legal question. Let me get to the last question, and then we're going to turn back to sort of the components of each of these concepts. Um, outreach then gets to the question of whether or not the organization is complying with its mandatory regulatorily obligation. Um, it, um, it's under the uh, let me stop. There's a mandatory obligation under the Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act to list all externally filled positions with something called an employment service delivery system and to engage in targeted specific outreach to agencies that promote employment of qualified veterans and under the parallel regulations dealing with individuals with disabilities to engage in that outreach for individuals with disabilities. Um, so having described the three major concepts, utilization, adverse impact, and outreach, I'd like Lou to turn to the next slide that talks about utilization. And I, I kind of touched on some of these concepts when I was describing utilization very broadly, but there is this goal-setting process. Um, titles are put into a job group. When the job group has a goal, the recruiter's role is to understand what titles are wrapping into the job group, how are jobs sourced. And um, when the employer is trying to remedy a goal in a job group, one of the things that this OFCCP administration is going to expect the employer to do is to take the data and the analysis and put some of it back into these written narrative documents, which for so many years simply were a regurgitation of exactly what had been done the year before. For decades, most government contractors would simply take the affirmative action plan, slap a new cover page, a new date, and perhaps a new signature, and stick it on the shelf, and it never became a living, breathing document. And the Obama administration clearly is trying to change that. The government through its compliance officers are pushing back when they receive a narrative affirmative action plan document that doesn't contain specificity in the section identifying the problem areas. They're looking for the government contractor to identify what, if any, job groups have goals. And the next section of the affirmative action plan is called the development of action-oriented programs. This is the word portion of the document where the employer is expected to list two or three very discrete programs, steps, methods, um, anything that the employer intends to do to try to improve the representation of qualified women and minorities in job groups that have goals. Well, 
when the employer uses external recruiting, it seems to me that there ought to be a discussion between the people putting together the affirmative action plan and the data and the narratives and the recruiters, because I don't see how an employer develops an action-oriented program that involves external recruiting without talking to the recruiters themselves. So you know, this is another element. And employers need to be circumspect about developing action-oriented programs. You don't want to bite off more than you can chew. These are legal documents. They are in writing. They can be requested by plaintiff's attorneys in litigation. If someone has filed a charge alleging that they were denied employment based on race, based on gender, the affirmative action plan is often a document that is requested. So an employer doesn't want to be putting down in the action-oriented program section of this you know, um, items that it never gets around to doing. You don't want to overcommit yourself. But realistically, you, know, you want to be able to put down two or three things for each of the job groups. And the likelihood is you are going to approach recruiting very differently when you are recruiting for you know, a director, a vice president, an executive at the top level of the organization than if you were recruiting a professional, a technician, an office and clerical, um, you know, an assembler. There are going to be very different methodologies that you would use to try to attract qualified candidates depending on the type of role that it is. And the government most clearly is expecting that these action-oriented programs are being tailored to the type of job that you're recruiting for. Um, I'd like to turn now to the next topic and the next slide, which is adverse impact. So to wrap up utilization, that's the concept of every year there's a goal potentially being set in a job group with underrepresentation, and the recruiters need to play a role in documenting what it is they're going to do to solve it and be included in the discussion of you know, what are we going to do to solve it. Adverse impact is where OFCCP makes its money. Adverse impact deals with hiring rates. It is a very simple little fraction initially. Female hires divided by female applicants, big dividing line, male hires divided by male applicants. Same fraction for minorities. Minority hires divided by minority applicants, big dividing line, non-minority hires over non-minority applicants. When that number is less than 0.80, meaning that females are not getting hired at least 80% of the rate that men are getting hired, OFCCP is going to pop those numbers into a more statistically precise calculation. And as a rule of thumb, if the total applicant pool for the entire job group has fewer than 30 candidates, the equation that you may hear mentioned is called Fisher's exact. When the total applicant pool in the job group has more than 30 people, you will tend to hear people talking in terms of standard deviations. It's a mathematical way of asking the question, why is it that so few women are getting hired compared to the number of applicants that we are counting? When OFCCP sees a statistically significant difference in hiring rates, it is compelled to follow up with the employer in an OFCCP compliance review. That statistical difference creates an inference that the employer is engaging in some discriminatory practice. When OFCCP observes that in an audit, it is going to lead to a follow-up request for information that the employer disclose the Excel workbook containing the line item data applicant by applicant for every requisition that was filled during the relevant time period. And thus, it brings us to probably one of the most significant regulatory developments in the last two decades, which is because the denominator of that fraction, applicant, is so critical, it is essential that every recruiter in a government contract or workplace understand what OFCCP's definition of an internet applicant is, and what that understanding triggers. In my world, there are three obligations that are triggered, and they are on the bottom of this slide. There is going to be a record-keeping obligation, 
there is going to be a solicitation of race and gender obligation. There is going to be a disposition obligation. I want to stop now and talk about what is an Internet applicant definition. And Lou, I'm going to preview. We're going to go to the next slide, and then we're going to come back to this one to talk about the solicitation, record keeping, and disposition. But I'd like you to put up the next slide that talks about the Internet applicant definition. The definition has four parts. The first one is that the candidate expresses an interest in employment through electronic means. They are uploading a resume to careerbuilder.com, to monster.com. They're putting a profile onto LinkedIn. They are coming into an employer's website and filling out a profile. They are um, filling out an electronic application. All of these different um, ways would comprise you know, having expressed an interest in employment through electronic means. Um, but don't worry, the definition has four parts. So the mere fact that someone has uploaded a resume onto CareerBuilder obviously doesn't make them your applicant just, just yet. The next step is critical. The employer actually considers the candidate for a vacant position. If you are dealing with an applicant tracking system that does not have a default mode, if there is no way for you to capture that there are thousands of expressions of interest that you never even got around to looking at because you were inundated with expressions of interest, you are going to find yourselves dealing with a lot of documents that you have to keep and disposition. Your applicant tracking system absolutely needs to be able to distinguish which emails did you open, which expressions of interest did you actually look at, versus who managed to hit the website and simply never even got looked at. Melissa, can uh, I just ask you one question here, and you and I have had this question. What's the definition of a vacant position? Because I'm looking at resumes right now where I'm just thinking about possible positions. I don't even have them. So what's the de real definition of a vacant position? The government thinks that you're going to hire someone because you have a position in mind and the employer has either a job description or an advertisement that it is trying to evaluate candidates against. If, you know, as a, as a, if um, in your role, Lou, if, if, in, if a company has given you a job description and said, you know, I think that, you know, we need you to help us find a candidate who meets these qualifications, you know, it, it seems to me they have a position in mind. No question, but what, is the, but what if they're just looking, hey, we want to hire 20 salespeople, we don't have any recs yet, we're just trying to see what the market's like. This and let's employer, assume it's not an outside recruiter, it's an internal recruiter. So they just, they're they just thinking about hiring next year 100 people, but none of them have been approved. They just want to see what, they just want to build a pipeline. I, there's nothing wrong with building a pipeline, you know, and, and we can talk specifically about building pipelines. Pipelines are simply creating an internal database, and there are record-keeping obligations associated with the expressions that you are considering on their behalf, um, and if you send them any uh, expressions of interest, any resumes, any profiles for them to consider, I, I'm telling you there's going to be a record-keeping obligation even if there's no position open. So, you know, in, in my world, once you're getting past prong two, you, an employer, a government contractor, is actually looking at a candidate's credentials with a position in mind. There's a record-keeping obligation. This person is not yet an applicant, but there's a record-keeping obligation. Someone is looking at a record, and is being, this person is being considered for a position. They're not right. an applicant, but there's a record-keeping obligation. Okay, good point. Okay, so now we get to the third prong. The candidate possesses the basic qualifications for the position. So it's very important. When an applicant tracking system allows a recruiter to click on an expression of interest, it's no longer in its default status. This person's credentials are being considered. You can never ever in my world leave the person in a status of considered. In my world, the decision tree must divide into qualified or not qualified because now we get to the legal obligation. If this person is a qualified candidate that is being considered for a particular position, there is going to be a dispositioning obligation that occurs 
from this point on. The United States government expects that government contractors will be able to tell it two, three, four years from now what happened to every qualified expression. And I kid you not, I got off the phone with a client uh, maybe 30 minutes before you and I connected on this uh, web seminar, and they are being asked for a 2009 audit, which is still going on in 2011, for them to pull the boxes from off-site storage for the candidates who were sent to interview in 2007. So four years ago, the employer made interview decisions that were not memorialized in an Excel spreadsheet. They were memorialized in paper copies. And as a result, the employer is pulling a substantial number of boxes out of its off-site storage in order to go through and determine whether or not qualified candidates were interviewed or not. So when the candidate possesses the basic qualifications for the position and the person is qualified, that triggers a legal obligation for you to disposition that candidate going forward. Was this candidate routed to a hiring manager? Did the hiring manager require an assistant to contact a small group of them to be set up for in-person interviews? Were any of them no-shows? Did they decline interest when the admin called them? Um, if the uh, hiring manager had a collection of, let's say, 12 resumes of qualified candidates and chose to interview only three, the government's expectation is that the manager has either him or herself gone back into the system and articulated what the preferred qualifications are that led the manager to call from 12 down to the two or three that were interviewed or to provide feedback to the recruiter so that there is some memorialization of how we got from the person met the basic qualifications but didn't meet the preferred and went from, you know, we had 12 qualified candidates down to we only wanted to interview two or three. And from the two or three, the government is going to expect there is a memorialization of, from among the three, um, what was the qualification that led the employer to choose one candidate over the other two. That is an incredible, burdensome, onerous obligation, in my opinion. But that is, in effect, the price of doing business with the United States government. You, you cannot not do it. The last prong is, at no point prior to an offer of employment does a candidate withdraw interest. And thus, for the purpose of who is being counted in the denominator of the equation for OFCCP in an audit to assess whether discrimination is going on, there is no legal obligation to evaluate candidates who withdrew interest prior to an offer of employment. There was no response when they were emailed or contacted about an interview. There were no shows to an interview. Um, there's also some flexibility on the part of the employer. If the candidate applies to three jobs, gets hired for one, the employer can assume the candidate withdrew interest in the other two positions. And you know, there's a, a question of how much time and effort it would take for recruiters to, when they see that someone has multiple expressions of interest in the employer's database uh, and is selected for one position, go back and change the disposition for the others. That's an incredible burden. But the Internet applicant definition, when you have individuals who meet all four prongs, there is a legal obligation to solicit race and gender. And depending on what the government does in 2011, veteran status and disability status, but that's not for today's discussion. Many okay, employers... So Alyssa, I want to, Alyssa, I want to ask you a question here. And as you and I have had this conversation, and okay. it just happened yesterday. I looked on Zoom Info, found 20 or 22 candidates for a financial executive position, just found the can I did have a job, uh, did find these 22. I sent them all an email saying this was the job. They did not apply. They were just names that I found. Three of them did apply and said, yes, they'd be interested in talking. In my assumption, I'd only have to report on those three, not Correct. the other 18 that I, although I looked, looked for them and found 20, whatever the number was, uh, 18 didn't, or 19 didn't respond. I can assume that three of them, only three should be reported on. Is that a true statement or not? True. So then I would almost contend is that the idea of posting a resume is the cause of the problem. Why don't we just look for candidates and send them emails and if so that becomes the methodology and those only report on those that respond. Now you've kind of addressed the internet applicant definition and solved the problem a little bit differently. 
Well, because you still have employers who, you know, for other reasons, are not going to have the bandwidth to have recruiters like yourself going out there and trying to find passive candidates. In their world, you know, given their resources, what they simply need to do is advertise for the position, sit back and wait to see who expresses an interest, and then go through the government's four-part definition. You know, are they actually going to get around to looking at all these expressions? If not, they're defaulted to zero. Otherwise, they actually are considered, you know, qualified or not. You know, okay. the, let me interrupt you, and I spot that only because we have time. So now let's assume I do get a database of 100 people who applied, so, and it's a real job. But then I send them all <coughs> my process. <coughs> excuse me. My process is that I send every one of the people who apply an automatic email out of my ATS. It said, here's the job. If you're interested, send us a half page or check this or do that or go to this site and do this extra step. If that's my process to have this secondary built-in filter, I would then... Uh, do the same thing that I did. These could be active candidates. They just send them all a, a resume, and that's our process. Can I do that, Change, add another step to the process that makes them go through another step? Sure. So we've got to redesign our ATSs. We'll get that done by Monday, all right. Sorry, Les, I just that to me seems to be a very important point there, is using this definition and managing your system not to just decide I'm going to report, but say, hey, you know, there's other things I can do to minimize this reporting burden and not eliminate the adverse impact and all that. Just minimize the, I mean, follow the law, but minimize the reporting burden. Right. And don't forget, though, the government is expecting you to keep a record of who you emailed and who emailed you back. That's the record-keeping obligation. Do you have to count as an applicant, the people who never followed your process. And the assumption, of course, is you apply the same process to everyone you are considering for this job. You can change the process from job to job. But when you're hiring for a job, you have to apply the process consistently in making selection decisions. But there's nothing to stop you from saying your process is that you're going to send people an email requesting uh, a resume, a paragraph, uh, a writing sample, uh, you know, a transcript, a copy of a certificate. You could ask them for whatever you think is job related and consistent with business necessity. And if they don't do what you ask them to do, they are not an internet applicant. Okay, just so you know, Melissa, we have about 20 minutes. Uh, so I just want, and I want to save at least five minutes or at the end, maybe a little bit over time uh, for Q&A. So just want you right. to get another time. Okay. For Right, and, and so, you know, in going back to the, go back to the prior slide for one second. So um, the prior slide, remember, had the three obligations. The record-keeping obligation kicks in when you have actually considered someone for a vacant position. The race and gender solicitation obligations kick in when you meet all four prongs. Most employers using an electronic applicant tracking system solicit this information very early on because it is administratively easier to solicit the information up front. Recognize, however, that if you solicit the information up front, OFCCP has the ammunition to evaluate whether you applied your basic qualifications in, a, in an uh, equal employment manner. Um, if you have uh, 100 individuals who expressed an interest in employment and you know their race and gender, and yet only 12 of them were deemed qualified, there's nothing to stop OFCCP from going back through and looking at 88 expressions of interest to see whether you applied your qualifications um, fairly. So just keep that in mind. Um, I fully support and understand why companies are going to ask for it up front but it does create a potential legal risk. It is administratively onerous and burdensome to try to wait until a recruiter knows that the person meets all four prongs before asking for it. I, I get it, but there, it comes with legal risk. And the last is that disposition obligation. As soon as you determine the person is qualified, the burden is on you to identify every subsequent step in your hiring process and to memorialize it. Anytime you have an applicant tracking system that is going to overwrite the previous disposition, OFCCP is going to come down on you like a ton of bricks in, an, in a compliance review. They expect to know who made the decision, on what day, when, and what was the decision, and you can't keep overwriting it. So you know, make sure that your systems are going to be compliant because otherwise they're going to catch you in an audit. What I'd like to do now, Lou, is to go two slides ahead, the use of Web 2.0 to source passive candidates. 
Okay, so in a Web 2.0 world where OFCCP promulgated this definition um, in 2006, there was no LinkedIn, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, um, and it wasn't being used to try to find candidates who aren't even looking. And what we see now is that this definition of expresses an interest, is considered for a position, is qualified, and doesn't withdraw, is being turned on its head. Most of the time we find that the recruiters who are talented, who are doing their jobs, they're not sitting back. Um, they are most certainly actually considering candidates for vacant positions and looking and assessing qualifications as their first step. Then what they're going to do is they're going to reach out to the candidate, just as you said, by email, and they're going to sit back and wait to see if the candidate expresses an interest. And as I mentioned before, there are record-keeping obligations associated with when you are doing an external search to fill a position and an internal search of your own database. You have to keep the searches. But in terms of who is an applicant, it seems to me that what's going to happen is you're going to wait and sit back and see if the candidate expresses the interest. If the candidate doesn't express an interest, they're not an internet applicant. And I have down here a placeholder for the OFCCP actual information request that came from OFCCP's Boston District Office. We defended an audit in August, and the OFCCP specifically asked this employer to produce all expressions of interest. It did not restrict its inquiry to Internet applicants. And I will tell you, had we gone back to the OFCCP and said to the OFCCP, hey, are you sure you really meant to ask for all expressions of interest, including the ones that we never got around to looking at? and including the ones who were not qualified, I assure you, had I asked the question, I know what my answer would have been under this administration. The answer would have been, yes, we intended to ask you for all expressions of interest. OFCCP spent two days, six compliance officers, compiling a list of all of the expressions of interest that were not counted as Internet applicants. They wasted six people's man hours times two days. And it was two full days. Um, none of this, you know, walking out the door at 3 p.m., not under this administration. They're working 8 to 5 um, with an hour for lunch. And they were there for two full days. And they came with lists and lists and lists. And when we tried to explain to them that under the definition of an Internet applicant, we produced as a denominator to our equations those people who passed all four prongs, the next words out of the mouth were, well, but putting aside the definition of Internet applicant, and of course, we stop them right then and there. We're not putting aside the definition of internet applicant. It exists. And if you simply want to spend your time putting together a list of people who expressed an interest and either were not considered or we determined were not qualified, that's fine. Go ahead, here are the documents, and you can go back and double check whether or not we actually considered them. But they're not internet applicants. But nonetheless, there are district offices around the country that are starting to delve into what is an expression of interest and whether or not the employer applied its criteria in an even manner to determine whether someone was qualified or not. So you know, having said that, um, this administration potentially could use the expression of interest information request um, a lot more vibrantly than past uh, administrations have. So let's go to the next slide. These are some of the questions that the recruiters were being asked during the on-site. Um, explain the hiring process from start to finish in excruciating detail. Um, literally, from how does a requisition get created and who approves it and um, whether it's entered into the system and who enters it, it, it gets into the most minute detail. Um, there is extensive discussion typically around what are the basic qualifications. Um, this notion of dispositioning. The government spends a substantial amount of time going through every disposition code that you use in your applicant tracking system and asking uh, different recruiters whether the code means the same thing to the different recruiters. Placing a premium on you in the recruiting to make sure that periodically you are training your own recruiters on what each code means. And it ought to mean the same thing for everyone. When you have qualified candidates who are not selected, this is a big issue for OFCCP. They love asking recruiters. So, recruiter, when you tried to fill position one and you had a qualified candidate pool and you got down to three candidates that the manager wanted to interview, two of whom were not selected for this rec but were viable candidates for another similar position, did you move them into a new requisition without having them reapply to it? <laughs> 
if that's your practice, then understand there's nothing unlawful about it. But you cannot then tell OFCCP that each requisition is its own discrete selection pool. There are statistical, mathematical, and legal ramifications if you are the ones moving non-selected qualified candidates into requisitions that they didn't apply for. The other issue that OFCCP is trying to understand is when you have what I call parent and child requisitions. You feel the pool of candidates for a sales representative position. You pick one out of the pool of 200. And the rest of the requisitions appear to be one for one, one for one, one for one. And that's not what you did. You had a pool of 200, and you really picked one out of 200, two out of 199, three out of 198, and four out of 197. Those are very mathematically different impressions that you will present to OFCCP in an audit. This notion of fielding a large pool and dipping into it many times is fine, but you ought to start working on the practice of having a parent and child rec. Is there any possibility on God's green earth in your system that the requisition can be labeled? You know, 2011 hyphen 001, 001.1, 001.2, 001.3, so that there is a way for you to link these one-for-ones back with the original pool that they started from. It really is important. And the other issue is, who is responsible for interviewing? Do those people take notes? Are they using a form? Where is it maintained? Part of the reason why my client is going into archived 2007 boxes is because the recruiters never circled back with the managers and fielded, collected the interview notes. Some of the managers have them in their personal filing cabinets. Others toss them. But there was no circling back on the part of the recruiters. And OFCCP views it to be recruiting and or human resources that retains all responsibility for ensuring that every single step of the selection process is being documented. Um, having said that, I'd like to go to the topic, uh, the next slide on outreach. And I show about uh, 14 minutes left. Yes, Lou? That's correct. I'd like to save five minutes for Q&A if we could. We will. Um, let's talk about outreach. Separately from the whole notion of an applicant tracking database and the dispositioning and the record keeping obligation, there are separate obligations dealing with outreach. A government contractor is not absolved from these onerous record keeping practices when it uses temporary agencies or executive search firms. At all times, the obligation to explain how people got hired rests with the government contractor. So if you are using temporary agencies or search firms, the contracts that government contractors have with these outside agents need to be crystal clear on what obligations the employer itself retains, what obligations it wants the temp agencies to undercur. The obligation rests with the government contractor to prove compliance. And there is a legal obligation every time the employer is conducting an external search for a position that will last more than three days and is not an executive and senior management position as that is defined under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And you know, if you want the exact definition, you can email Lou, you can email me, we will get you the exact definition. But if it's not a position, three days or less, if it's not an executive and senior management position, there is a legal obligation to be listing it with the state job service, the state unemployment office. That's what they call the employment service delivery system. And OFCCP's regulations are crystal clear on this. Simply because you decide to use an executive search firm or a temp agency does not relieve you of the obligation to post. So either you decide to post and drive these individuals back to your preferred agency to vet the candidates, or you tell the executive search firm, when we're not searching for an executive, let's just say it's an outside recruiting agency. Maybe I should be more careful in my term, when you're using an outside recruiting agency to recruit for a non-executive or non-senior management position, a sales rep, 
the sales rep positions absolutely have to get listed with the unemployment office, the job service, the state workforce commission. So either the agency is going to do it or you're going to do it. But if you're not doing it, it's a violation. And the violation doesn't have a fine or a penalty, but it comes with an obligation to keep reporting your data to OFCCP for one or two more years. You stay under their nose, and you are more likely to get selected for an audit three years from now if your audit closed with violations than if your audit was clean. The last thing I'll say is that OFCCP has on its website resource and referral directories. They are PDF files, and they, are, uh, they were last updated in 2004, but they are a start. State by state, city by city, um, they, they will tell you, um, you know, that there are um, resources in your jurisdiction that you can use as a start. Google them. There, the contact information may be new, the telephone information may be updated, but if these agencies still exist, you may be able to get a new contact source for them. And the last thing that I want to say before we take some questions is I want to go to hot topics. Anytime your, um, your workplace is using tests in the selection process, you are assessing candidates as part of your process you need to make sure that you are complying with the uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures. Every person who takes a test has to be solicited for race and gender. OFCCP and EEOC, for that matter, are becoming more critical in employers' use of credit information for jobs that don't require handling money or secure information. They are concerned about the use of background checks as a means to eliminate otherwise qualified candidates when candidates are really not going to be exposed to um, the type of information that employers should be concerned about in a background check. And EEOC and members of Congress recently wrote to many, um, uh, to many employers and to the, well, Congress wrote to the EEOC, um, there are employers who are refusing to consider candidates if they are currently unemployed. I urge you to be very wary if you are using that as a criteria in your current advertisements. Um, EEOC is about to make it a top priority. Um, and with that, I've concluded the topics that I wanted to present and would like to leave the rest of the balance of the time for us to answer questions. Okay, let me, let me ask a few and then maybe JJ or Brian can look at some. Here's the one that I would ask, uh, Alyssa, as you were chatting. Are there any areas that just stand out like a sore thumb that's going to trigger this audit? Or I mean, it's like the top three real problems you just really have to have your act together? Well, OFCCP is now using something called active case enforcement, and every company selected for an audit is going to have a full review. When OFCCP gets the summary data, for hires and applicants, it performs these equations. When you have one-for-ones, it's going to tip off OFCCP either that you're using parent and child requisitions incorrectly or that you're converting temps to regular employees and potentially not counting as applicants the candidates that the temp agency vetted on your behalf. So when the equations are very close to a one-for-one, OFCCP smells a process problem and or a record keeping problem. When there are very few selections against a very large applicant pool, OFCCP um, is going to suspect that what you're giving it are all expressions of interest, and then it potentially has the ability to say, you know, you selected 12 people and your applicant pool was 3,000. Please explain to us each step of your selection process. And that may be a very different process for jobs that you've rolled into the same job group. And the recruiters ought to be playing an important role there in explaining the process. The data ought to be telling you what the story is. OK, let me ask you this. What if you do have adverse impact? Is there a way? that that could be justified, and if so, how would a company go about doing that? Well, absolutely. Adverse impact is simply an inference that in the aggregate, the data is telling one part of the story. At all times, then what happens is the employer has the burden of production to show that notwithstanding some statistical outlier number, 
it maintained documentation that shows why it selected the most qualified person for the job. The problem that we often find is employers cannot recreate the process. They can't remember why they chose the person they chose from among the qualified candidates. They don't remember what the preferred qualification was that got 12 candidates who all were qualified, down to the three who were interviewed. So you know the recruiter is long gone, moved on to a new employer. The manager who hired the candidate, long gone, moved to a new employer. And now the organization, the corporation, the company, is left with the, the information out of its payroll system, who was hired, and all of this documentation that wasn't dispositioned, and there are no records to explain the thought process. But absolutely, the employer can produce information that shows, regardless of race or gender, we hired the most qualified person for the job, you know, notwithstanding whether they were pink, black, you know, yellow, green, Asian, Hispanic, whatever. OK. Uh, let me kind of just go through some of the questions here. So again, if anybody has any questions, I'm just looking at the questions you put in here. Uh, and I think this is one that I thought was interesting. I'm kind of going back and forth. JJ O'Brien, did you see any there that just stood out for you guys? Well, I think there's lots of questions about who's really an applicant, all the profiles that are built online and when they turn into an applicant based on internal processes. So that's one that seems to be standing out. And then people just want to know, how do I manage all of this? What do I use? What tools are out there? So again, maybe from an applicant, you know, I don't know if you, that's a pretty broad question, Alyssa. Maybe you can kind of just give some guidance on, uh, you know, just because you look on LinkedIn at, and look at some names, uh, what do, what's the real obligation? You have to keep the search. Is that person an applicant? If the person doesn't ever respond to any message, I mean, it seems to me it's pretty obvious, but it might not be obvious in the current world. I mean, if, if you're not looking on LinkedIn because you're trying to fill a position, you're not really assessing someone based on a position you have in mind, and you're just out there trying to find out whether people are you know, potentially interested in you as a company, no, you're not saving all of that. And I, and I agree with you. There is, it is a very fine line when a recruiter is, you know, they really don't have a position in mind, or they do have a position in mind. And I don't know how OCCP is going to figure it out at the end of the day whether or not the recruiter had a position in mind or didn't have a position in mind. But what's going to happen is, you know, someone is going to get hired. And when the OCCP comes and interviews a person and says, you know, what was the process? You know, someone is going to say, oh, yeah, you know, I got an email from a recruiter asking me if I was interested in the job. So, you know, I went on to the employer's website and I applied. Applied. Well, now the government, having heard that from the candidate who was hired, is going to go back to the recruiter and say, so is your process to email candidates? How do you know which ones to interview? Or how do you know which ones to email? Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm constantly looking on LinkedIn, and I'm always looking for people who, you know, may have certain credentials. I mean, you know, believe me, I think I could prep a recruiter to answer the questions the way we need them to be answered. But, you know, that's a very fine line between what do you have to save and not. But you know, if a recruiter is being engaged to really look for, you know, someone who has the credentials to fill a vacant position, I don't see how the recruiter doesn't save the emails and the responses. I think they, I think they probably would. My sense is they might not, I think they have to save the searches, uh, but sometimes it goes in, hey, you know, the hiring manager says, hey, we're looking for a senior engineer. Uh, and you don't know what level it is. Is it level one, two, three, or four? And you kind of look online and you say, ah, here's a bunch of people who are this level. And then you open the, the official rec and target that range and get the rec approved by cop and all that kind of stuff. So really, I mean, you do some this preliminary research without knowing exactly what it's going to be. I don't know if it's a 50K job or 75 or 100K, but then when you figure it out, you say, okay, now I'm going to go into it. So it's all that preliminary work, which seems to take place a lot, whether it's a corporate or a third party. Yeah, no, I know. Um, <laughs> I'm just giving you some of the reality, and I don't know if it is. And I, I think uh, Martin had a good question here. Martin, I'm trying to find your question here, and it's going pretty fast. Um, you know, like keywords. I mean, that was Martin said a question. You know, we all use keywords for recruiting. Some recruiters are better at it, and some aren't. You have to actually save those searches. Let's assume it is for a real rack. You got a real rack. You got the search. You go and zoom info. You go on a just a boolean search. Where does all that take place? Right, let me read you what the government expects you to be saving. For purposes of record keeping with respect to an external resume database search, the contractor must maintain a record of the position for which each search of the database was made, 
which database it was the, the recruiter was searching, and corresponding to each search, the search criteria used, the date of the search, and the resumes of job seekers who met the basic qualifications for the particular position who are considered by the contractor. So you are maintaining the keyword search, but then when it comes to the resumes, you're only keeping the resumes that you actually considered and determined were qualified. Okay, let me, this is the last question. I think this is the way it works. I think most of we, the hiring manager comes in and says, I want A, B, C, and D. I want an engineer with seven years experience in this and this and that. And I get this pretty rigorous requirement. The reality is, is that at the end of the day, and you might have excluded lots of people in the initial two weeks that didn't meet that criteria. The manager says, ah, I don't need seven years, I'll, need, I'll take three to four years. They're getting a little bit desperate. And you don't review that, you just find, ah, i got a couple of people with four years. But you had all these other people two weeks before that that didn't meet the qualifications. If you went back and looked at it, you might have found some others, but you didn't. You just found, a, a, hey, Joe, I just found this person who's got four years but real good. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll hire that person. But how do you handle that? Because that, that seems to me to happen lots of times. Oh, and OFCCP thrives on that because, you know, if you're willing to lower your standards and accept someone less qualified, the government is going to rake you over the coals because, you know, you advertise for a position and people um, who might, you know, have otherwise applied, you know, if you had lowered the bar, they self-selected themselves out. You know, and if um, the government loves it when you are willing to take someone who is less qualified and especially when the person who's less qualified happens to be white male. Oh, they, they just, they thrive on it. <laughs> okay, so you can do it if they're not a white male, but no, you, you can't, can't do it if you it can't. is a white don't male. Get, don't get me wrong. I'm being cute. I, I am being cute. You know, you, you can never, ever, 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 ever make a decision based on race and gender. But it never, see, I, I as a, the outside lawyer, you know, trying to defend a company in audit, I'm never brought on when the company made the exception for the diverse candidate. I always seem to get the ones where, you know, they made the exception for the white male. Okay, so therefore we've got uh, uh, a way to prevent the problem is when you do that, yeah, I think you obviously have to be very, very careful if it's a white male. Uh, you probably have to be less careful when it's a diverse candidate. As you silly as the rule that is, that's can't. probably not no. a rule you would advocate, but it's one I might advocate. No, you better have really good reasons why you can't close out that wreck and reopen it with the qualifications that the manager is willing to take, as burdensome as it is. And I hate to be the one, you know, the you know, person yeah. bearing the bad news. The, you have to close out the wreck with the higher qualifications and start from scratch. You need to advertise it with the lower qualifications. You need to post it with the job service. You need to field a pool of candidates that meet the minimum qualifications, and you need to select someone who is within that parameter. There is nothing to stop you from fielding a pool of lower qualified candidates and preferring more. Presumably they all met the floor and you're going to take one candidate all the way up to the ceiling. You can never, never, never take someone who is below your floor. They will, they will excoriate you for it. Okay, well that said, with that, uh, Donna, see now, I think we should end. Melissa, Alyssa, I want to thank you very, very much. There's no question in my mind you have now proven yourself to be the coolest lawyer in the country. <laughs> you are so funny. However, let me also go the other way. I've met a lot of lawyers that, uh, well, never mind. We'll even go have a bad lawyer joke here. I want to thank you very much. Just so everybody in the, in the group knows, you will get, uh, we will post the uh, handout. I assume I can post the handout. You'll get a, uh, a, an email from us with all the info, all the contact information and next steps. Lisa, I thought this was great. I want to thank you very, very much. Very insightful. Unfortunately, not pleasant, but uh, powerful and profound and insightful. So I thank you very much for that. My pleasure. And I, you know, I don't want companies to wait until an audit to be caught. If there's anything else we could potentially do to help you come into compliance on your terms, you know, proactively, you know, everyone has limited resources, but the idea is to do this on your terms, not theirs, and to do it up front, you know, obviously let us know. Great. Yes, yeah, so we'll put the, you know, all your contact information as well. I was selling this, this slide. Thank you very much, everybody. That concludes our webcast for today, and I am sure we're going to get Alyssa back sometime in the, the spring as well. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Thank you, everybody else. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye now. Great. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Alyssa. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. You will be receiving a, an email with that follow-up information as promised. I'll be looking for that. And in the meantime, have a great afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. Goodbye, everyone.